Welcome to the Grappling We Re- See exactly. Grappling Rewind Podcast. Welcome to this week on the Grappling Rewind Podcast. In this week's show, we are going to recap Grapple Fest 17 and the IBJJF Crown. And we are also going to preview the ADCC Oceanic and Asian Trials. As always in the show, I'm your host, Maine. Join my co-host. Austin. How you doing, Austin? I am good. How are you, man? I am. Uh, I'm here this week. <laughs> uh, it's been a busy week in my professional life, but we're here doing the show. Very happy to be here. Have some events to talk about um, for what we were able to see. Uh, there was a lot of big matches this weekend. We are mainly for this week just going to cover um, the finals for the crown and a couple of select matches on Grapple Fest, and then talk about again the AD, the upcoming ADCC Asian Trials. Um, notable news this week, kind of not related to that, but related to not sorry, not technically the upcoming Who's Number One card. Uh, Gordon Ryan is headlining that versus Hulk. We will preview that on next week's show because that happens on the 30th i think of next month of november mm-hmm. uh the fight pass invitational that is gordon ryan versus mason fowler looks like it just got moved from the 9th to the 10th of december um when we'll preview that again when we get closer to that i think that match is honestly kind of low-key really interesting yeah for sure because fowler is a beast and one of the strongest guys at overtime like people kind of forget about how good fowler is if you if you just gifted the back and put Fowler there like he beat Craig twice at Sug in overtime like he is a monster and so it'll be kind of curious to see how Gordon addresses that match so I'm really excited to talk about that match for sure after we preview Gordon next week for the Hulk match and then like it'll be two weeks before we get get a chance to preview that I want to probably pull in some matches and some some like grapplers and some like uh, matches that they had between to sort of talk about contrasting styles again with Gordon he's developing and looks kind of so different mm-hmm. year to year it may not be you know contrasting his matches might not be the best way to approach it but i think it'll be interesting so looking forward to previewing that when it comes um i think this is gordon's second or he has one more after this match on the contract for flow mm-hmm. so it'll be really interesting to see if he's if they do resign him i assume that they do especially with all the stuff that craig's been saying yeah um recently. It'd be hard to imagine flow operating without gordon being their number one guy yeah like yes <laughs> I, you know, I wish i wish i had more to expand on that yes it would <laughs> I mean, be I mean, it would be I surprising it. i mean it's I don't know. They poured so much into him and then also the Pedigo guys. It'd be kind of wild to me to like abandon shit because a contract ended or something. Yeah. No, I would, I would be pretty, I would be pretty surprised as well. Which is like, again, I want to see Gordon competing. I want to see all the top guys competing as frequently as possible. So mm-hmm. hope that, you know, hope that does get sorted out and we see those guys competing because that's sure. what I want to see. Um, let's see other news. Oh, ADCC just announced they are going to the pyramid in, uh, January, January 20th, yeah, which is so funny because this event for IBJJF was in the pyramid, and I hope ADCC has more lighting <laughs> to put it nicely. Um, there was a whole That's host a, of technical issues this week. Yeah. That's a very nice way of putting it. I feel like, uh, thanks. Yeah. I feel like. Uh, I'm going to have to do it a couple times, Austin. You got, ADCC you're... production's pretty unmatched, so yeah. I think the contrast in the two events will definitely show. The production value of ADCC has never been better, so mm-hmm. it'll be really tough to. For yeah, the... tickets are coming up. For uh, I think yeah, Black, Black Friday. Friday. Yeah, yeah. Yep, we're getting Takes a bunch. We're getting the whole grappling Ryan team together. We're planning Vegas. I'm still trying to find out flights for uh, <laughs> for West Coast trials because oh, those yeah. are dude. That's Easter weekend. Those flights are expensive. I'm sure. And my wife and I are like, she's like, uh, you want to pay that much to go to Vegas for trials? I was like, I don't want, want to. Yeah, say want yeah, is a strong word. I don't want to, but I will. Yeah. Um. So, oh, funny enough, this week, uh, so on El Segundo, which is Craig Jones' podcast, mm-hmm. um, him and Freddie were on there, and Freddie, I think, does some production. I think he does a lot of the media work for B Team. Okay. Um, and they were talking about. Uh, Craig was talking about the press conferences that Flow puts on. He goes, they're more like Q and As because there's no media guys. And he was like, <laughs> who are what media guys exist? And Freddie, who is who used to run BJJ World, so much BJJ World TV. Mm-hmm. who is a straight-up GSU media guy, was like, there's some people. And he was like, <laughs> just Times, them. And he was like, and uh, that guy from Grapple Me Ride, he's everywhere. Nice. Big so shout I, out. It was, it was really cool. Like somebody, I got like two people sent it to me. <laughs> and I was like, that's kind of cool. Yeah, for sure. Because uh, Freddie's been a super cool guy. And we've worked with, worked not with him, but like around him and in the same space yep. with him for a lot of time. And it's been cool to see all the really great content that he's produced. So I appreciate that. Yeah. The guy from Grappling Rewind. <laughs> um, he's like, we're everywhere. I was like, I would absolutely fly down to Austin to do a press conference Q&A with those guys. And actually have 
questions and answers and be yeah. the media. Yeah, and I, yeah, quote, be in, in quotes. I mean, we're st- I'm almost done with all the interviews I did from East Coast Trials. There's two more. There's some behind the scenes. There's some technical issues with two of the interviews that I did, one with Daniel Kelly and one with Amanda Levy. Um, I'm fixing them, but there's been a couple of issues with the files. And mm. so they will be out soon, but that's where those are. If you haven't seen those yet, that is why I really appreciate those athletes giving me their time. But that's why you haven't seen them yet. If you want to check out the rest of the interviews I did at um, East Coast Trials, you can find them on the Grappling Grind YouTube page. If you also want to see Austin on my face for the video show, you can watch it there. Um, a big portion, actually, it's funny, more and more of our audience is actually watching on YouTube in yeah. the last like year and a half. It's really popular with the kids these days. And it's been really funny to watch the demographics like shift from like being like 99% audio right. to more and more percentage being video now. So it's been kind of funny to watch that. Um, so I don't think I have any other news other than there's been more ADCC stuff announced and trials is coming up, which is exciting. Uh, the registration list, again, looks pretty strong for Asian trials. We'll preview that at the end of the show, run through the people that Flow have kind of highlighted and then run through. We have the big registration list, run through that really quickly. Uh, but Austin, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with Grapple Fest 17? We have, I think, two or three matches on that we're going to talk about. Or do you want to start with the crown? We're going to do all the mains for that. Yeah, let's start with Grapple Fest. Okay, so let's let's start at the top. Uh, William Tackett defeats Owen O'Flanagan via decision at Grapple Fest 17, and he wins the under 90 kilogram. Uh, it's listed here, so I have Jits Magazine's results up. I like, I really love how they format their results. Mm-hmm. Big shout out to those guys doing a great job. They are pretty much nowadays my go to for results most of the time. Right. Except for Crown, they kind of stopped halfway through on the Crown results. Um, but I think William now has, like, I think what they're calling the international title for Grapple Fest, which is like the unified. Um, with international grapplers title and then they also had on this card a couple of British titles which I really appreciate in Grapple Fest they made a post and they talked about it I think on the last event or on the previous event where for their talent across the pond for us because we're here in America mm-hmm. um, the European talent they are putting out these British titles or these other sort of regional European titles right. and then giving those folks an opportunity to kind of fight and then unify the title or Uh, go and fight for the international titles, but it gives the guys and the women that are more on the local side an opportunity to contest for a title in Grapple Fest. And I really appreciate, again, what Polaris and Grapple Fest are doing, those two big organizations over in Europe, highlighting and showcasing that European talent and giving them a platform. And so it was cool to have some of those uh, British titles on the line here in this event. But William is fighting for the International title. international title, I think is yeah, what we're calling it. Yeah, I think it. that's really cool. Yeah, I guess we should just call it that. Yeah. Even though they haven't really officially listed it as that. Right. I think it's really cool that they do that, and I think it's a little, it reminds me kind of like a WWF back in the day when you have like the intercontinental title and the world title. It's like, please explain to me the difference between intercontinental and world, but great. That's awesome that they have like something that's a vehicle for... They're local guys, so be like up and comers. Like really local, like you're like local, yeah, local, Europe, like the entire, the entire country. continent. Yeah, all of the UK, local. But cool that they have like a regional title for that, yeah. like an avenue to bring up some of their guys, and then yes. also how good are you against international talent? Yeah. And and it's it scales I, it in a way that you can make a card very easily to say we're unifying mm-hmm. a title. I think that's really I, cool. I also really like because we've talked about for years, you know. People don't. The, the whole reason of us doing this show is because, like, we all went in 2017. Who's Craig Jones? Right. And then you go back and watch, and he'd been winning things for years, and like been very, very, been a very, very great. No one accidentally gets to ADCC. Sure. And so, like, to get there, you were a very good guy. There was no reason that no one should have not known who Craig Jones was in 2017. Right. He'd already been to ADCC. Like, there was no reason for that. And so, I like that organizations are bringing up their more regional and local talent because you give those people an opportunity to get showcased and get onto bigger events, move, get the experience against higher level international talent. Right. And those folks go on again from sometimes from these smaller regions like Australia mm-hmm. with Lachlan and Craig go on to do amazing things at the world stage. But giving those people an opportunity is a lot of times what makes the difference in careers. And so For I sure. love that they're doing that. So love what Grapple Fest is doing. Uh, would love the stream to be a little easier to, to manage. Yeah. Um, but again, the pay-per-view, I think it was like under, it was about 15 bucks US, not bad. Not which bad is not bad again for the talent they're bringing. Let's talk about William Tackett versus Owen O'Flanagan. Owen is very good. I want to caveat yeah. that before we talk anything about the match. Sure. Owen is very good. Former um, ADCC Trials winner. Mm-hmm. Like, go back and watch his match at ADCC with Wagner. Yeah. Hell of a match. Breaks Wagner's foot and Wagner's just like, okay. Like, mm-hmm. very, very good. 
William Tackett here looked next level. He looked yeah. good at you at East Coast Trials a couple weeks ago. Didn't win that, but I think he placed third. Sounds right. I think, and he beat J-Rod there. Like, mm-hmm. very, very, very good showing. Beginning of this match was a little more tentative, and I was because Owen has such a dangerous guard. Owen O'Flanagan, we talked about in the preview of this matchup, we knew he was going to go into the legs. Yeah, of course. Like, that's his bread and butter. That is what he is so good at. And I was curious, like, William's a very, very good leg locker in his own respect, but it's Mm -hmm. not really sort of where his preference, like, given his druthers, he is not going to go into the legs and, like, fight you there constantly. He'll usually be more of a top top control guy, positional guy. For sure. And... A lot of mount and some back work. But usually I see him like really likes to work from mount. I was curious if he would be able to deal with Ono Flanagan's guard because Ono Flanagan has given so many guys problems with his guard. Go back and watch Ono Flanagan's match with Thor. Mm -hmm. Like Thor works through Owen's guard, works through Owen's guard, works through Owen's guard repeatedly, but never really can stabilize him down for most of that match. He's probably one of the best Nogi players at regarding. I mean, he's definitely up there. Maybe not the best but one of the best yeah, one for of sure. the, he's in that echelon of like guys that are like good luck passing his guard so. yeah and Tackett looked freaking dominant yeah, like, like five minutes into the match you he kind of a switch got flipped mm-hmm. and you could see that Tackett had sort of figured out and maybe either the pace he was putting on Owen caused Owen to slow down a little bit or mm-hmm. Tackett got the timing but like something changed in the in that five minutes of this 50 minute match that one third right. time Tackett figured out what he needed to do to get past Owen's guard, and then he sort of just did that. Yeah, it was a lot of like a pinning one leg with one hand, mm-hmm. and then kind of camping on the hips with the other hand just to see like how long he can kind of withstand that pressure, and then kind of switching back and forth. Because that Owen pressure opens up your hips, and eventually it fatigues you, and For sure. you're forced to start to re-square, and off of that re-squaring to retain your guard. For sure, and then you can do the same pass. thing on the other side, and so there's, yeah. their hips just get too tired to maintain... Uh, stability while you continuously passing to either side. Yeah. So I know um, Craig Jones talks about it a lot about splitting legs and pinning legs is kind of the way he likes to talk, talk right right up into that, like right up into it. It's like the way that he likes to start passing people. I think the Rotola brothers do the same thing. They use slightly yeah, really different. similar, really similar. They passing. use their feet to do it. They use their feet to pin the legs, and they mm-hmm. go to north south to try to kind of camp on guys. But same kind of thing. It's like can I split the legs and separate them, or can I pin one leg and separate it? And then once I do. How long is it before I can like kind of clear to the hip line? Mm-hmm. And then it's kind of like a losing battle for the guy on the bottom because over time, no one's core strength can withstand that much pressure. Right. Especially at the heavier weight class. Like Tackett, yep. again, is not um, – I think he's 88 now. Oh, really? Th- that makes sense. I think I th- could be wrong about that, but I think he is at 88. That makes sense. Um, this is for the under-90 title, so 88 makes sense. Yeah. I think he was cutting for 88 to trials. I could have mm-hmm. that. Way- I could have the weight class wrong, but he was with J-Rod, who I think was 88 again. I don't think – I, a couple guys moved around with day before Reigns, and I sure. I got everything mixed up recently with that. He passes. He gets. He has a really really beautiful um, mount take mm-hmm. here, like where he's where Tackett is low on Owen's hips, and he has a really good cross face underhook, like very traditional maintenance of side control, and then gets up on the knee low, like you will in ADCC to score the neon belly without having that like aggressive post out that IBGDF forces you to do to score. And then he immediately windshield wipers over Owen's legs. And we have talked about Tackett's passing to Mount before on the show. Mm-hmm. I'm always really, really surprised like how well he does that windshield wiper motion and prevents his leg from coming over Owen's legs. Because Owen is a guy that'll snatch you up and immediately go back to the legs from that position. Sure, Tackett yeah. Very infrequently gets stuck in the way that he passes across your body in that spot. He never, I don't really see him get stuck in the quarter guard very often. I think at even a lower instance than most other top level guys, like he's just very, very good at making up, making that pass while also opening his hips and staying very, very low. It's just, it's, it's somewhat unique for Mm. how he is able to do it. And I can't exactly put my finger on technically what makes it different but i think maybe it's just that he he's able to stay lower than most folks i am used to seeing do it yeah that makes sense i feel like that's like one of those micro transitions that uh gets overlooked in a lot of jujitsu where it's like he's doing this small thing better than most people even though we all know how to do it if that makes sense yeah yeah we know we should probably it's the the invisible jitsu yeah it's old school term of like it's like oh you don't really it looks the same we know how to do it but he does it a little different it's very very hard to tell and like there's really no window for you to like snatch his ankle Mm -hmm. which it seems like 
you know, everybody has that window, and it didn't seem like he really did. Yeah. Uh, once he gets there, he works for a really interesting, not really interesting, um, Owen does a really great job of not getting head and arm because William has a monstrous head and arm. Mm -hmm. And you actually watched this a little bit before the pre-show. Yeah. You picked up on something with the way that Owen was defending the arm and the way that Tackett was actually fighting for the head and arm here I thought was really interesting. Yeah, I think um, a lot of people try to use like the kind of traditional answer the phone sort of defense where you have your hand kind of posted against the side of your head and Owen had like a reverse answer the phone kind of style. It's like he had his frame in, so he had his hand in between uh, the arm and his delt instead of his uh, hand on top of his own ear, which I thought was really interesting. I'm like, man, I don't think I could finish like that if I was trying to get their delt to touch the side of their neck. I couldn't tell if he'd ended up there. I think he ended up there like almost accidentally where mm -hmm. it's like William was super diligent with his mount, mount – with his maintenance of mount. Ooh, sure. Too many M words there. <laughs> and Owen's arm kind of got like, he was diligent with keeping it down. Mm -hmm. And William went for it anyway. It was really interesting. You don't see people fight for the head and arm from this position a lot. I feel like uh, it probably isn't a bad move to go for it anyway. Because a lot, that's a super uncomfortable position on your yeah. shoulder. And I feel like a lot of people who probably less, have less shoulder dexterity probably would have mm -hmm. tapped or moved their hand out of the way, which would have been a mistake. Yeah. You move your hand, and you no longer have a frame, and your you get choked. Touch your, yeah, your delt can you touch choked. your neck, and you get choked. So I thought it was smart to keep that frame in there. I'm not sure if it was intentional or not. I couldn't but tell I was thinking, either. like, man, that would be really hard to choke through yeah. if you try to finish in the way that most people do. Yeah, we, we were looking at it. I was like, I don't think he can finish there. But again, it's also in Grapple Fest. Mm -hmm. It's... Owen is having to defend it enough where it's like, well, yeah. it's a valid submission attempt. Sure. That's going to be scoring. That's going to be dominant position that you're working. Yeah. So there's no real reason to not go for it. And that's, again, right. one of the reasons I like this kind of rule set is because it showcases that type of jiu-jitsu where it's like, hey, man, there's no reason. It's, yeah, it may be kind of a long shot, especially versus a you know top-level guy like Owen. But, but yeah, showing control, showing dominance. Yeah. And then also, I mean, in that position too, it's just tiring for the bottom guy to mm -hmm. like kind of sit there and wait it out. It's tiring on your shoulder. It's tiring on your neck. And then you're still getting pinned. So by the time you get out of it, even if you don't uh, have the sub there, still worthwhile. Right. Uh, what was interesting here as well is, is after Owen is, does a great job getting out, and then William starts doing long range passing. Like he know he doesn't go in. He goes into Owen's guard a little bit later, but he starts, I think once or twice, doing what we see um, Esteban Martinez do, mm. where he almost does that head jumping headlock cartwheel pass oh, yeah, over yeah. to get around the guard. And it was something that was I thought was really interesting because previously guys have tried to kind of jump around Owen's guard and had very little success with it. I was, I couldn't figure out exactly what William was doing differently. Maybe he had Owen a little more tired and he yeah, had that's kind of what I assumed. Like uh, after all that pressure, I mean that was a long time that he stayed under underneath yeah. side control, then into mount. Like and William was playing like a low, heavy, like mother's milk pressure crushing yeah, and mount. Even, and to the same get thing, there. even just even leading up to that, the passing was really pressure heavy. Mm -hmm. So getting knees back to chest and inverting infinitely harder when you're already kind of gassed from doing that movement a lot right it was it was very interesting to watch William sort of like again get I think two more passes later in the match pretty pretty handily cementing his title for for grapple fest here um mm -hmm. I thought it was a, I thought it was a really great performance from Tackett again I cannot wait to see him at West Coast trials it'll be very very fun uh to see him potentially take another one yeah absolutely and again props to props to owen for being able to withstand that level of pressure we for know sure. how tackets how good tack it is and he is only getting better so i think it was a great match for grapple fest to put together any other pieces on the match no man i think that's it all right we also had uh ashley bendel defeating maria kelly this was unanimous decision really great work from ashley she wins the grapple fest under 55 kilogram title we had kieran kerchuk defeating ellis younger so kieran actually gave a i interviewed kieran a uh, couple of weeks ago at East Coast Trials, mm -hmm. talked about his move to B team and some other kind of training changes that he has made. I got a chance nice. to watch some of his matches and film some of his matches at Trials. This was a rematch. I didn't know this was a rematch, but these guys had met, and Kieran talked about that in the interview he did uh, with Grapple Fest before this. Mm -hmm. And Ellis had beaten him at an IBJJF event, so he wanted to get this one back. And I always, again, I always mm -hmm. like when promotions set matches up like this that the grapplers want where it's like oh you want that one back yeah let's let's do it i think a lot of the promoters nowadays are getting better and better at that as opposed to oh, yeah. these two guys same way it's like no these guys have history like let's That's let's a better storyline yeah for sure and we're talking we're talking about it now yep 
Kieran's able to get this one done. He gets um, he hits Ellis with a sweep, and then they go back and forth a bit. But really, what wins this decision for Kieran, I think, is just activity and, and like submission. He's just more active from yeah. the bottom for more of the match. Yeah, it was kind of a leg lock shootout for a lot of it, but it looked like Kieran was kind of leading the exchanges, so to speak. So if it's like a dance, he was the one leading. Not necessarily yeah. that uh, Ellis wasn't, but it looked like he was countering more than he was producing the offense. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, like you said, about a minute and 20 left. There was kind of a crab ride sort of position from uh, Kieran where he kind of looks like he's going to take the back, but then he just kind of springboards himself back on top. Yeah. And I think really that... interesting sequence, too. I was yeah. I was super surprised with because we know Kieran is, is a big false reap guy mm -hmm. and he almost uses the entry to the false reap to like sweep and get up. It's a, it's I want to go back and watch the sequence again because sure. I don't I don't I wish I had a better way to break it down. But it was a really interesting use of like a partial inversion to act like you're entering the false reap to get the reaction from a younger to pull out mm -hmm. so that Kieran could drag up and then sweep off of the motion. It was like, it, it was very interesting because you're watching essentially two or three and four reactions down the rabbit hole right. of like, Oh, you know, you know that Kerchuk is good at that false reap. So you're defending the false reap and then Kieran's using that to set up something else that you now have to defend both the false reap and the pass attempt. And then you get out of position and Kerchuk's able to use that to get on top. It was just a right. really neat little view into the meta sequence and that's one of the things i like about doing this show is that mm -hmm. we learn guys games a lot more and you figure out oh, he's really good at that thing and now you look out for it and other grapplers they go against especially in a rematch like this right. you know younger knows what kieran's good at he's faced him before he's beaten him before and so he knows how to counter it and so you get to see the evolution of both guys game together in this weird like meta arms race for sure and you mentioned something earlier like uh having a match in ibjgf you can kind of see the difference in style. Mm -hmm. Like, when you have a sub-only match, it changes what you would do. So, like, in an IBJJF match, of course, you can go for leg locks now at Black Belt, but back, you know... Three years ago. Yeah, three years ago, even, you couldn't. There was no reaping and no heel hook. So, it's like, well, okay, well, if you're a leg lock specialist, you're doing IBJJF, you may win on points just through, like, I don't know, maybe like a 50-50 sweep scenario, or, like, I stay on top longer, you can win a decision that way. And in a sub-only kind of shootout where there's going to be a decision at the end no matter what, it's kind of like just play towards whatever your, your sub-heavy game is. Yeah. And that's kind of what we saw. Just both of them trying to go for leg locks most of the match. Yeah, it was good. It was a fun match. Also on this card, we had Max Bickerton defeating Jack Grant uh, to win, and Bickerton wins the Grapple Fest under 90 kilogram British title, mm -hmm. which, again, love to see that. Also some other fun stuff on the card. We had Shane Fishman defeating Ben Bennett via armbar. We had Nora Schultz defeating uh, Simone Caffrey via rear naked choke. Joe Gibbs defeating Oscar Salvez via submission. That was an arm triangle. Stevie Ray defeating Shane Curtis. Again, big fan of Shane Curtis. Athletes for Satan uh, <laughs> via submission. That was a heel hook. You know, unfortunately, he doesn't get it done here, but Again, again, a ton of submissions on the card, like way more than we we, we cover a lot of jiu-jitsu. Uh, Grapple Fest, especially on the top end of the card, on the main card, had way more submissions than is standard and normal. Kind of just speaks to the excitement that that card brings. Uh, any other kind of closing thoughts on Grapple Fest? Um, no, it's a great event. I'm glad we could cover it again. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. So let's move on to the IBJJF crown. Again, we're just going to cover the six main matches for this um there was a kicking it off there was a bunch of really weird stream issues for the first couple of matches like there yeah. was no english commentary it was frozen it was super dark there was no overlays but like once that got sorted out it was a lot better yep. um but that sort of informed we kind of were all discussing because it happened on sunday night mm -hmm. and didn't finish till 10 o'clock at night those events we kind of had to figure out what we're going to do with all the issues that it was having, we went, okay, we'll focus on the main event. So that's where, that's kind of why we're only going to talk about the main events or the, the finals for the brackets. Sure. Because it was so kind of scuffed at the beginning. We made an executive call at the beginning. We didn't know if it was going to get corrected or not. And so we put our efforts towards that. Um, a little view behind the curtain for Grappling Rewind. Uh, we all run full-time jobs. And so... Sometimes we gotta we gotta make a decision of like okay we're gonna cover these so where do you want to start with this do you have a preference for what match you start with here? Um, I then don't. we can get we can get to the weirdness at the end because there was a couple of them. Um, yeah. I mean there yeah. was there was a double DQ in a four man bracket. That's pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah. Let's start. Let's start. Okay. Let's start at the heaviest weight men and go reverse. So like men women will bounce back and forth. Oh shit! Who is the heaviest weight? Right there. 
Okay. So men's ultra heavyweight, the yep. crown match. We're going to call this the crown match. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm running off of Flo's results here because I think Flo actually yeah. put together a really good collection it's of results. The, I think it's in the order of yeah. the actual card. It, it's it's good. Flo, again, for some of these events, does a really, really great job. Mm-hmm. And I love it. Like, they have the matches linked here. They have the scores linked there. It's like, this is... I wish that all the events on the platform had this kind of format. And it just makes it... It makes it easier for us, but also as a fan, because we were having issues at the beginning... Like I got the, I was like, I'm going to watch it once they're sorted out. So I turned it off for about an hour and came back to it. And then I got to see the write-ups and then got linked to the matches. It's just, again, as a viewer, it was a much, much nicer way to be able to digest an event mm-hmm. versus need, needing to be required to watch four hours of matches in a row in right. case there was some issue. So men's uh, the four-man bracket, the final match for this was Eric Muniz versus Roosevelt Souza. And Muniz takes this over Souza. Uh, it was tied on points, 2-2. Two, two, mm-hmm. And then it was advantages. Yeah, he had a ton of near sweeps. Um, and to be honest, I think Eric had the cleaner sweep of the two. Uh, he had kind of a yeah. pant Ooh. and sleeve grip. And he ended up getting in like a hip bump sort of position. He did like a real mount, sweep. Kind of. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. like for Souza's sweep, again, not in IBGF, and we've talked about our feelings on IBGF rules. The more we do the show, the more vocal <laughs> I am that I'm really a fan of ADCC rules and which everyone would kind of make the swap over to him. Again, it's tough, very, well, it's also very biased because sure. I work for ADCC, I ref for them, <laughs> a judge, so it's yeah. like very notably biased. Um, but when I watch it, IBGF, it's it was very funny for this match in particular. You see Roosevelt Souza, and he would score this in ADCC as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, the initial sequence was Roosevelt Souza did a really great job of tying Eric Muniz up, grabbed him, and then you saw them sort of teeter back and forth and kind of Eric was kind of looking for back kind of looking for a top position it was it was a really interesting key sequence mm-hmm. and then you saw Muniz kind of go ah it almost seemed this is probably not the case this is probably me being a junior in my understanding of exactly what they were doing it seemed like Eric Muniz went I don't really want to end up in the worst pace, place in this sequence I'm just gonna sit mm-hmm. let Sosa take top position and then I'm going to get my grips and then immediately re-sweep him. And that's kind of what he did. He, I mean, Eric Muniz kind of sits back, yeah, takes the sweep, collects and kind of frees his leg from what Roosevelt Sosa has. And then immediately within, what, 20 or 30 seconds. It was pretty quickly after. Is able to do kind of a modified hip bump. Yeah, it was, over. A, it was like a hip bump with like a opposite, opposite sleeve and pant grip. But it just, I don't know. I think if you're as athletic as Eric is, I think you have so much confidence in your guard that like, if I get the grips I want, I'm going to sweep you. So it's yeah. like, well, I'd rather concede grips in this exchange versus like two points because I know I can get those two points back. Yeah, that's that's weirdly, and that's it's such a. I hate saying that mm-hmm. because usually that's not the case. That's what it looked like here. Yeah, it looked like he was like, I'll get it back. Yeah, I, I, and I, usually I don't athletes don't make that. Like the the guy that scores especially first, IBGF, especially for usually key, loses. gripping is so important. I feel like wins. I mean, yeah, the advantage of having better grips is almost like night and day for Guy specifically. Yeah, it was just a it was just a very funny sequence because Eric like at least seemingly just goes, oh, I'll get it back. Yeah, and then and is able to do so. And then towards the, I think the first scoring sequence of the match was what with like seven minutes left or six minutes left in the match and the rest of the match where the rest of the advantage was scored there were some penalties earlier for sozo as well yeah um, on but, both ends there was some some like stalling penalties yeah mm-hmm. there was a lot of that this this card um ibgdf man i really wish that they would modernize some of their some of their stalling calls and like I, I wish they would allow for like activity mm-hmm. like pushes mm-hmm. um but it's they don't right now, and we're seeing we're seeing the game, especially at the gi at this high level, get a little slower. Yeah, Muniz puts up you know so many really really close yep. sweep attempts. Souza is able to get his hips back in front and never get over. I was really surprised a couple of times that Souza's even when he's completely spread out and Muniz has like a pant grip, yeah, and has him completely splayed to the side that Souza's able to prevent the sweep or get his legs back underneath him it's pretty incredible it's so hard to maintain your balance when one leg's being outstretched and you're kind of balancing either on like a knee or a foot to like yeah. stay upright and then balance on either your hands or a hand that's a really difficult thing to do hyper athletic movement to be able to stay uh keep yourself from being swept yeah but eric Muniz takes the uh, ibjjf crown uh that's such a weird yeah like, it is odd that you'd have a world champion and then like a crown champion 
Yeah, I don't. It's, really, it's odd. Look, man, I'm happy these guys are getting paid out. Fifteen thousand sure. to the winner, which finally I IBG- we've we've bitched about it for years and years mm-hmm. and years. IBGGF runs very few paid events. Right. I am happy again with all the issues that we do have with IBGGF from now and again for myriad of reasons that they are putting some money back into the community, into the athletes at the for highest sure. level, and like helping support their careers because um, they run a lot of amateur tournaments and they're right. you know the biggest geek series and tournament provider in the in the sport it is nice to have that money kind of come back to the athletes eric muniz is the crown champion now and gets fifteen thousand for that so moving on to the women's super heavyweight crown match we have uh, gabriele passani versus tiny porferio i was really curious um again we see we say tiny like now and again we just haven't seen her we actually that's probably incorrect now the last six months we've seen her much more frequently she's sort of back into competition mm-hmm. and absolutely back into competition shape Pasana is so hard to beat in IBJJF she is probably one of the best strategists in the sport yeah and there's really not a whole lot it seems like you can do about that like Dude. if she scores an ad good luck like that's as good as a score for her. Like yeah, well she's if she scores two, you're probably gonna lose by two. <laughs> like she until you do something, she doesn't necessarily her first give match anything up was so as as a viewer it's like so frustrating to watch mm-hmm. because you can tell how good she is, but she she plays it perfectly. Yeah, she plays it perfectly where she's in the close guard. Who's the first match against? Uh, Amy Campo, I think. Yeah, the Campo match. I was super excited about this match because I I figured whoever won this match mm-hmm. would win the whole thing. That's a good guess. Yeah. Um. And she gets Campo in the guard. Mm-hmm. We're, we're talking about the finals, but the first match that was really interesting, and it really speaks to how Pasana plays mm-hmm. in all the tournaments. Campo is a really like good, dynamic, aggressive passer, mm-hmm. and Pasana just wraps her up, slows her down, and then works the sweep, works the sweep, works a different sweep, and goes through probably six or eight different lapel variations for sweeping options and gripping options, and keeps forcing Campo to defend, defend, defend. But never opens up the sweep enough to allow Campo to get her hips out and mm-hmm. start passing from range. Like, Gabrielli only ever gives Campo enough where it's like you can defend, but you can never get really out of the close guard. A couple sequences, Pasana may have been able to start getting a sweep going, but she feels that Campo's in a good position to start to counter and then close the guard again and close yeah. the guard again. It, it was, again, in IBJGF, that is a textbook match of how to control. It's like you are doing enough. Mm-hmm. You are varying your sweeping offense enough, and you are preventing a really, really strong passer from being able to get leverage to start going. As a result, not a whole lot of positional changes happen. Sure. I would love to see – this is a match that only occurs in a rule set like IBJJF, but mm. in the rule set like IBJJF, the one we're having the match in, the one where money's on the line right now, yeah. plays it perfectly. And, like, can't falter because Campo is one of the best in the world. For sure. Undoubtedly. And to control her like that was very, very impressive. So – Finals match, um, slower finals match. Again, Pasana's matches can be. She wants to have them slower. Like that is the pace that Pasana wants to work at. And the only scoring sequence in this entire match is a takedown that gets reset out of bounds. So Pasana foot sweep kind of does a train wreck or Morote Seonage. Yeah, it's like a collar drag, and then she ends up like a. Uh... Tiny goes with like all fours, mm-hmm. and then they kind of get reset before she, you know, can can finish going all the way behind her back. So they kind of reset her like rear body lock. Yeah, I thought the reset was was like okay, mm-hmm. but when they reset her, and again, this is something Porfirio elected to do. When they stop the match, Porfirio is almost um not a wheelbarrow position. What's the? You're gonna get me talking about wrestling terms. I don't no, know. No, it's where like she's four she's, points. she's fully standing, but she's not like down. She's like yeah, yeah. she's like leaned over, straight legged, hands on the mat. Mm-hmm. When they reset them, Porfirio elects to not put her hands back to the mat, and Pasana eventually gets gets her there very quickly. And on the reset, Pasana is able to knock her down mm-hmm. and force. I personally thought that the two for the takedown got scored really quickly, and we talked about this too. on the pre-show. Yeah. It would have gotten scored she in the next long, fifteen yeah, seconds she controlled anyway. The back long or. Controlled the, 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 top, the top, top turtle long enough yeah. that, you know, she would have scored the points, but it did seem like a quick two. The initial two yeah. um, to get the score was, I think, a little fast because I don't, I didn't think that she had fully controlled um, Tiani, like, in the bot as a bottom player for Agreed, three seconds. because if she popped back up to her feet, like, once her knees touched, then you would have kind of had a really quick two call. Yeah. That, like, 
Again, but this is but, also this is also me being kind of clouded sure. by 80, a lot of ADCC matches yeah. where it's like the takedowns for ADCC I understand very very well, mm-hmm. and for IBJJF I'm I've recently you know on air been making little mistakes with my understanding of takedowns. So this mm-hmm. also could be me seeing it, and I've straight up IBJJF straight up IBJJF folks going like that's not it's absolutely terrible. But Maybe. it yeah. seemed a little quick for my understanding of the control of the position, but that control is different sure. than what I've been watching a lot of. Um, but she does score the two. And then forces Tiny into the guard, who Porfirio is also a very, very good guard player. Yep. Um, and Pisana just has really good maintenance of top position, prevents Porfirio from really being able to get anything going. Yeah. Porfirio Hail Mary footlocks at the end, but Pisana knows that she's won it. And that's the whole match. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't, that was the, the takedown. That, yeah. was the, that was the scoring sequence of the match, and that was really the main. I think interesting piece to talk about of the sure. match. There was a clock choke attempt at one point, but um, it was very brief. They've mentioned it here in the article, but it was it was. Yeah, the significant thing was for sure the yeah. collar drag and then the reset. Yeah, the Morta Sanaga was good though, and I'm happy we have Kendall on commentary because Kendall actually um, has a judo background and knew the correct name of the throw. In this uh, this upcoming match. What? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's this one. This next one. Oh, you're right. Yeah, I know. It was it was a train wreck throw. Sorry. It wasn't Rote Sayonage for this match. It was the train wreck throw. Same. It was that collar drag. Rote and train wreck are the same. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's okay. It's been a hell of a week. <laughs> My bad. Yeah, so this was, yeah, collar drag outside. Yeah, collar drag. And then the... Let's move on to the match where this let's actually happens in. Men's crown match, Felipe Andrew versus Gustavo Batista. Both these guys are really fun first-round matches that we're not going to get a chance to talk about right now. Um... But Felipe Andrew, man, yeah, eleven to zero here. Yeah, so this is your uh, this is your Marote match. So Marote Seo or train wreck, however you like to describe it. Two yeah. hands on one collar, drag them to the mat. If they stand back up, you can go right into a Marote Seo Nagi, which is same as a Ippon Seo Nagi or a Drop Seo Nagi. Either one. It's one arm shoulder throw. Uh, yeah. Marote Seo Nagi. I think the way that he does it, he does it with the same side. And he does it with the sleeve grip. I think he does have the sleeve grip. But he has sleeve. I think he did have sleeve grip here. So he turns. So Marote Seo Nagi. Typically, when you throw it, um, you lift and then turn and then roll to the side. Basically, you have a same side collar and then an outside sleeve. And you drop your collar hand across the body, and you roll, and you turn almost, not quite like you drop for a drop sayonage, mm-hmm. but you turn probably at about, like, 130 degrees more to the side and take it over. <laughs> you can throw your leg out for, like, a Tani Yatoshi or a Tai, tai, tai Yatoshi. Um, but Felipe Andrew just, like, drops down yeah. and takes Gustavo Batista over with it, and it was... It was a very, very exciting uh Yeah, judo it was a sequence. great throw. And then I feel like Felipe was dominant pretty much the whole match. I think he ends up scoring like 11 or 12 points or something. Yeah. Really beautiful mount take from side control. Like Again, really it, similar to what we saw from Tackett earlier, yeah. where he gets he kind of controls Batista, and then he's able to just come up into the mount position. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Yeah. I think we're seeing a lot more of this like uh, – uh, new wave style of like almost like the mother's milk sort of position where you're trying to grab underhooks, you're trying to stay really low in the mount and like ride so that your chest goes into the, your opponent's face. I think we're seeing that even even kind of going more into no gi than we used to, in or gi. going to gi, excuse me, yeah. than we used to. It used to be more ride you'd mount see a little it higher occasionally, yeah. But you 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 were having guys look to ice to get the arm bars off the top of the mount, like that was the sure. tra- a traditional thing to go for in the gi was I'm going to ride them out high in your chest and I'm going to punch you over and look for like a gift wrap to the back take. Yeah, you see a lot more like a, yeah, like S mount sits so that you can do seated head and arm or like a, like you said, like arm bar, like those sort of attacks. Now I think we're seeing way more arm triangles. Mm -hmm. We're seeing way more uh, like choke variations. Yeah, Yeah, because people are staying so low, which I I kind of dig and it, it kind of makes the mount more dangerous again, which I like. Make the mount great again. Make my great again. Yeah, it was it was a very nice match. He, again, Flip Andrew just controls Batista. You know, in a way that I I can't think of the last time I've seen Batista controlled in this way. Somebody absolutely will send me a DM of like, remember this match, Michael? Like, oh, yeah, remember <laughs> that. But I was just surprised at the way that Flip Andrew was able to kind of control Batista's hips specifically. Yeah, there was some great work late in the match with Batista being able to get Flip Andrew off of the mount position and like go up into the dog fight mm-hmm. and fight to the outside. But Flip Andrew stayed super diligent, super good 
punching of the cross face in the front to prevent Batista from being able to get up all the way and like being able to turn the corner like he needed to to get in front of Felipe Andrew. Yeah, he uses that lapel as like a super underhook, which is like something I think more people should, I mean, if you don't already do it, something that more people should definitely do. Yeah. It frees your hand from having to uh, use a far side underhook from side control. I think he uses it earlier. Yeah, he uses it in the side Mm -hmm. control in this match and in that dogfight position. Mm -hmm. He has kind of the lapel pinned down where if you have the opposite side lapel and then you loop it behind someone's back you can grab it on the uh, on the other side and it functionally works as a long side underhook yeah. on them and it prevents them being able to square their shoulders into you and you can keep them controlled so much more easily because you have a big ass underhook grip yeah. on their shoulder or on their armpit almost and it's uh as a guy we have a lot of guys at our association that play it it's an absolute nightmare. Yeah, it's terrible. There's no like good. You can't you can't get your hands to that grip to break it. Yeah, and so you have to eventually basically buck someone off to be able to get out of it. There you, you need some really crafty ways to get out of it. I think we're seeing again, especially like in this match, more and more folks use that and use it very very well to control super active, aggressive guys like Batista. Yeah, for sure. Any other pieces on the match? No, super dominant performance by Felipe. Yeah, eleven to zero was again only one more, only one match, one more match was more dominant than that uh, points wise in the finals. So that was Felipe Andrew taking the crown over Gustavo Batista. Moving on to the men's middleweight match, we the only sub of the finals. I think one of two subs on the night. Mm, I think there were like three subs total that I mm, saw. It was just that we almost no. saw the armbar. Armbar wasn't a sub. She didn't get it. No, not that one. There was it was the clock uh, choke. No, there was somebody who had a. I think Tayani had a had a oh, submission yeah. as well. Yeah, she had she had a variation of like a scarf. It was um, like a it was like a bow and arrow choke from without, the side. Control, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, from, from the like, top of like turtle. Yeah, it's like she didn't have the leg, but kind of the same positioning as yeah. a bow and arrow. And then Felipe Andrew also hit one, hit a modified head and arm. Uh, he right. hit a how did you how do you do the choke? I never heard it called that until you called it that in the chat. <laughs> yeah, where did you get how do you do the so from years ago? On uh, so what we're talking about the matches, Felipe Andrew, his earlier match with Francisco Lowe, mm-hmm. he hits what is called a head and arm choke. But normally, a head and arm choke is your arm is their arm is the top arm. Okay. So you trap it for the how to do the choke. You trap their arm under your body and across. Mm-hmm. I've explained this really poorly. So years <laughs> ago on Fight to Win. Um, there was a commentator, I forget who it was, but this, they got finished on a fight to win and the guys, Oh, how did you choke? And I texted Josh of the grappling rewind and I was like, what the hell is that? Mm -hmm. And he goes, Oh, it's just basically instead of having the head and arm where the arm is up, it's just the arm is low Mm -hmm. and it's, it just swaps which direction, which direction the choking arm is essentially. Um, and I didn't explain that well at all. That's okay. Go back and watch it. You'll know exactly what he means. It's a how to do choke. (laughs) <laughs> head and arm choke is when that when the arms are switched so the opponent's arm is in the other direction this is a how to do choke so it was interesting to see that and that was one of three subs the only other sub we had the only sub we had in the finals was we had um Tyne and Dalpra defeating Andy Murasaki via triangle choke three minutes eight seconds was the finish mm-hmm. Murasaki was in this choke for two minutes and eight seconds yeah or he, something like he that use that like a well, well, well battle about what the name of this is but wrong way triangle setup some people call it reverse triangle how you want to say it but Austin, the legs everyone, are locked the everyone way. calls it reverse triangle you call it I don't. Tri- you have your own triangle naming sequence I don't. which I want to disagree with <laughs> but it makes so much sense when it you makes explain it, it it makes it clearer the way that I explain triangles but I won't get into that we'll go down a crazy rabbit hole of me next time we have a show in the outro we'll go through it we Looking don't have like time a, for it today I'll, I'll make myself like the Charlie Day meme and I'll have like everything all mapped out Look crazy like pointing at things like you can clearly see here yeah pepe sylvia but okay. the the problem is that it actually does like i want to give you shit for it it makes a ton of sense <laughs> when you explain it but i just learned it the way that everyone else learned it and it makes sense to me for all so. of you who are insiders and have heard me rant about triangles you heard it here first man says i'm right i don't want to give it to you but yeah so has a has a wrong way triangle or reverse triangle. So, Murasaki Murasaki is trying to pass yep and uh Dalper takes offense to that apparently <laughs> and I was just super impressed that Murasaki got triangled off this. Yeah. In the first place. Like, he has Tynan's hips kind of controlled. He goes to do, like, a back step and run around. And then Dalpra goes, oh, that's not good. And then rotates his hips 
and then throws his leg that Murasaki is controlling. He gets it out, throws it up over top so that he's locked in a reverse triangle or a, as Austin says, a wrong way triangle. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we were watching it and we were like, oh, does he really finish that way? And then like a minute and a half or something like that into this sequence, he is able to grab the top side leg, switch his leg so that the thigh comes, the thigh that is across Murasaki's neck goes parallel to his shoulder blades as opposed to it being the opposite arm the one on the underhook yeah, side of the arm locked in the traditional way that you'd finish a front triangle yeah yeah front triangle. It makes make, makes it easy to understand it does <laughs> but yeah i thought it was really interesting uh murasaki was doing the right thing in ter- and obviously in terms of like defense by locking his hands underneath of his butt when he had the wrong way triangle locked because that's it's such a hard choke to finish when someone has like a really strong grip and their hands are yeah. locked together and their elbows are flared. You just can't. Because you can't get their delts to touch the you neck. You can't push him in high. Like no matter how strong Dauper is, we know he's strong. Yeah, so I was, he just can't push Marisaki's shoulders into his neck enough to cause mm-hmm. him to tap. So then when he switches it to the more traditional finish, I was really surprised because it's not like he got his... Usually when you switch uh, back from like the wrong way to like the more traditional finish, usually you're looking to get the arm to go across the lap. So usually you make the arm go cross lap, then you switch your triangle. He doesn't do that, and he still had his arms locked under his butt, but he just, like, squeezes, like, it looks like straining you can squeezes. See, you yeah. can see him, like, shaking as he's yeah, squeezing. Yeah, the head, squeezes the knees super hard to get the tap. And but you I'm can, so surprised you that, You like, can finish this, but it's... Yeah, clearly. It is... Uh, it is uncommon. At the highest levels, we actually do see it finish, like, not infrequently. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was just... It's wild, like a crown event like this to see. Yeah. You saw Tyler go like, "I'm gonna finish this right now," and you For just sure. saw him just listen, gas and just crush. Yeah, you could tell he to put touch some the max effort together. into it. Yeah, uh, he wins the he wins the crown. Three minutes and eight seconds. It's pretty impressive, dude. Tyne and Dalpra, I think he probably has a little bit of a chip on his shoulder after Worlds this year. Dude, do not I mean, meet Jansen Jansen Gomez again. That'd be awesome. It would be awesome. That that Jansen should have been in this bracket, but. <laughs> Tynan takes it over Andy Murasaki um, in impressive fashion. Just that was the entire match. Yep. The entire match was one pass from Murasaki attempted, and Dalper went, well, better finish. Yeah. And that was the entire sequence. Just wild at this level. Yep. Men's featherweight match was Sam Nagai versus Isaac Doderlin. Uh, both guys had a pretty close run to get here. This was as close as you can get. Um, Nagai takes it 1-0 advantage. Yeah, I feel like, um, especially if you watch some of their the, the previous matches, even this tournament, um, man, still at the at the lighter weights, playing lapel guards and playing like these super technical double pull style guards, it's still the meta, like yeah. for Guy. Like there's no, there hasn't been like this, I was thinking this while I was watching, there hasn't been this big shift like there has been in no Gi, for like a new meta in gi in a while, yeah, it's interesting. Like in, like, in no gi, especially with lower like weight classes. Did, like when did lapel guard become a thing? Like eight years ago, and it's still uh, a pretty heavy yeah. thing. And I'm not saying it like you, you, that's a that's a pretty no, big but generalization. Think, think but that, that was when, like a new thing on the scene. When that was like did, everybody did it, and then it hasn't changed that much. I think about it coming on the scene when Keenan dropped mm-hmm. the warm guard DVD. Yeah, and that was like tw- I, I remember about like 2014. Yeah. And that was like nine years ago at this sure. point. And, it, and then it was like this thing. It was like, oh, yeah, it's a thing that Keenan is doing. Mm-hmm. And then you had other folks like pick it up. And then about three years later, so probably like 2018, mm-hmm. guys started to really – we saw Shane Jimmy Taylor win yeah. the Worlds with like a really – There's so many comp- variations yeah. now. I'm not saying it like I'm, – I'm just saying like how many things are like that in Nogi? I don't think there's that yeah. many. But in the in the lower weight classes for the men, mm-hmm. we've seen that sort of meta stay there, where it's like the lapels give you such good control, mm-hmm. where you can keep these matches astonishingly close, and yeah. all the guys are super athletic, yeah. can hold grips for the entirety of a match, aren't gonna make technical gripping errors and mistakes like we used to see right. even four years ago. Right. And again, you had four world champions in this bracket for featherweight. Guys aren't gonna make mistakes. Right. They're not especially versus other world champions. They're not gonna like they're not gonna slip up. And you saw that, which is really partially why this I'm not gonna say it wasn't exciting, mm-hmm. but it was just so close. And if you watch the lower weight classes, you can see 
you can see that kind of sh not shift of meta but you can watch all of the grip switches for the control yeah and certain times when you see guys go and there, i'm gonna i don't remember the name of the guard because i'm i'm not a huge lasso guard player we're as an association moving towards nogi more and sure. we're, we're having a little less lasso Most guard play. Is. yeah um it's a lapel and you loop around loop around the leg and underneath in your hand guys are really struggling to be able to get the leg out and pass that to yeah. start unraveling Even the guard people like double wrap it around their leg too we're like they've wrapped it around their leg and then out and through and then wrap it again around their own leg mm -hmm. and it's like man this is like almost like boy scout knot tying class to be able yeah. to unwind some of this stuff and this is where i think this this is the catalyst for me because i i think i'm we're talking about this not from a very technical perspective sure. because I just don't have enough terminology sure. to be able to unravel exactly what these guys are doing. I think I need to spend some time mm -hmm. and like get a DVD or talk to someone or go train with someone and go, okay, give me the, give me the white belt 101 of like what all of these transitions and guards are called yeah. so I can have a better lexicon to talk about this. But this is men's featherweight at the highest level and this match For really sure. exemplifies, you know, 1-0 advantages, some scrambles here and there, but both guys are good enough to cause essentially non-scoring scrambles i think yeah featherweight is the best division for ibgf for non-scoring scrambles mm. like when you get to rooster weight or light feather people can score because they can just leverage that little athleticism with a little more explosiveness that they have at featherweight the body types the styles and the games have this weird convergence mm. where nobody seems to have that little extra like attribute here or there to be able to consistently win those scrambles or out scramble someone or out unravel a guard quicker than the other guy. It's a really mm, interesting kind interesting. of convergence point. So uh, Nagai takes this over Dodolin via advantages. Lightweight crown, we had Natalie Habero versus Luisa Montero. Uh, Luisa Montero, not to be outdone by Felipe <laughs> Andrew, was yeah. like 12 points to zero. Yeah, there's like a really cool sequence where... Uh, Louisa started the knee cut and then uh, Natalie tries to turtle out of it, like kind of tries to turtle towards her, and she kind of switches her hips really quickly. That was a put her knee wild inside to, get, sequence. to try to take the back. I watched that like four or five different. Actually, I showed you. you yeah, look yeah. at this. You're like, yes, yeah, we rewatched cool. it. Yeah. Um, the camera angle was perfect for it. You can see Habero, like, just. I'm, I'm trying to explain exactly why I thought the sequence was so interesting, but it's essentially. Na uh, Luisa Montero, or sorry, Natalie, wait. Oh, it's, it's switched. Yeah, Luisa Montero takes this, if I said that wrong. Mm. Natalie Habero goes to, gets a turtle. Mm -hmm. And Luisa Montero, sort of in the transition to turtle, switches her hips down to force Habero to settle the hips, to settle like into a hard turtle, and then switches her own hips back in order to punch the knee into the hole for the turtle that she's made yep. in order to take the back. Yep, between that knee elbow space when you're talking about the turtle, that you it's kind of like the coveted space to try to take the back yeah. when you're uh, attacking a turtle. And like she switches it to it so quickly that it's like, man, that's really impressive. Such a heads up movement to go mm -hmm. from knee cut on one knee and then switch the other knee back into but that space she's also low with the chest which i thought was really interesting that there's mm -hmm. not it's almost purely a hip movement to do that mm -hmm. as opposed to like a whole body movement i thought it was really interesting that the top of her chest stayed kind of as stationary as it was while she fixed this problem with like only the lower half yeah, of her yeah body. it was sure. like that i think that's in thinking about like watching the sequence again that's what stuck out to me i was like oh that was a specifically slick sequence because mm -hmm. she was able to maintain that top control pressure with the hands right. while fixing the problem with her legs. Uh, For sure. She then passes to mount to the back or sorry to the back then to mount and then gets up for two more points at the end of the match. Yep. But this was just this was Luisa Montero in the driver's seat the entirety of this match yep. from bell to bell. Um, even at the beginning really nice uh, initial two point sweep sequence from her uh, from the spider from like a it's like a Della Spider kind of yeah grip. I, you could call it like a Della Heva foot in the bicep however you like to phrase that mm -hmm. but it's like a foot one foot in the arm and then the other foot either Della Heva or touching the hip mm -hmm. and then she ends up grabbing I think a pant grip at the, at the lower yeah. side yeah yeah pant grip and a sleeve grip to end up getting the tilt yeah it was a really like but it was a quick nice sequence and you saw like the leg pummeling was perfect mm -hmm. she got um, Habero kind of walking towards her and walking into the guard to be able to hit the off timing to lift the leg up and push away on it. 
just beautiful performance here from Luisa Montero. For sure. She takes it 12 to 0 and is now the IBJJF Women's Lightweight Crown Champion. Moving on to the Super. Oh, no, that's. Uh, is that it? Is that all? That's it. If you want okay. to talk about the third place matches, you can. I. But I. Uh, oh, let's talk about. Um, just because it wasn't funny, <laughs> but it was interesting. Um, yeah. Jao Gabriel Hosher, men's ultra heavyweight. Uh, that was there was only one match mm-hmm. or two matches in this entire bracket because in the initial match, Zhao Gabriel Hosha uh, took on Victor Harnario and they got double DQ'd. Yeah, they both were pretty much not willing to concede uh, a takedown, so they just stood the entire time. Once they got kind of towards the edge of the mat, some attempts were made, obviously, mm-hmm. because you know, obviously, if you get uh, taken down out of bounds, it's a reset in IBJJF. So that was kind of where the only the action was, but it kind of had to get to the edge of the mat for either guy to kind of do anything. They both got hit with stalling penalties, then eventually got, you know, double DQ'd for an action. Which is four four stalling penalties. Yeah. Which uh, is wild. I've seen it happen a couple of times in IBGF, but it's rare. Famously, um, Australian kid. Blue hair. Unity guy. Oh, man. Uh, I think I know exactly what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Why am I... Xanadu Guard or something. Yeah, Xanadu Guard. What's, what's his... Man. Not oh, it's going to it's gonna kill me. It's He's got like three names. Oh, uh, Levi... It's Levi Jones Leary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus. It's okay. Famously, Levi Jones Leary <laughs> Famously. at Worlds in like 2019 got double DQ'd for the guard pole. Yeah, yeah. Because um, if you... If, and I've just... I feel like a it almost ways. happened to, like... Really shortly after that, like in Spider or it something. Happened, it almost happened to him in Spider before that match. Yeah, yeah. Like Levi Jones Leary will do this, but it was it's it's super uncommon to have essentially four stalling calls or twenty seconds of a double guard pull with no one coming to top. Mm-hmm. Um and then you can get that's another way you can force this. But it it's very uh I think Yao Gabriel Hosha was doing a little more. I think he had some better attempts, but it was it was frustrating to see these guys, both top level yeah. guys be so unwilling to change the game plan at all. And I've talked about even we talk about Levi Jones Leary when he does mm-hmm. this. I wish that the guys would be I wish both parties because it takes both guys to get double DQ'd. Mm-hmm. I wish both parties would be willing to open up their game and do it. But it is an interesting we talk about it for Levi Jones Leary, like being a benefit where it's like you know if you're fighting Levi Jones Leary mm-hmm. that he will get double DQ'd over this. Yeah. So if you don't want to get double DQ'd you have to be the. It's like playing chicken. Like yeah, you have to be, be the, the one to do your thing, and he's better on the bottom. For and sure. Good luck. Yeah. So it's it's not really the case here where it's just. I wish I would have seen somebody pull or something here. Yeah, for sure. But it was definitely a very interesting uh, fold and wrinkle to this event. Yeah. It is uncommon. Um, women super heavyweight. This is the only other sub on the car that we haven't talked about yet. Was Tiny Porfirio kind of. With a really interesting choke from the back versus Melissa Stricker Kuto, mm-hmm. uh, go back and watch it. It's I'm, I don't know how strong Proferio is, but man, from looking at the way that she the, the position that she has, mm-hmm. partially Stricker flattened out, and she's able to still choke from here is uh, it's pretty impressive, pretty wild. It's like I said, I think it functions kind of like a kind of like a bow and arrow, but just. Didn't have like a full control of that top leg like you'd normally want to have for bow yeah. and arrow, and no no real control of the hips. Just looked like hip pressure, and then the same sort of uh, collar strangle, collar choke sort of positioning. Um, but yeah, it's kind of wild that that got the finish. Yeah, uh, other great match on the card. It was a lot of fun. Go back and watch um, the matches. I would love this to be better lit. Mm-hmm. I would love it to be a little quicker. Yeah, um, these things run really slow. Between every match, there was like a minute or two break. Yeah, I really wish they would run these things. If, again, it's one hundred twenty thousand dollars on the line. the The camera work was shoddy. Mm-hmm. Um, it was way too dark, and you could even tell how dark it was at the event because you could see the camera ISO gain popping mm. in and you could see like the blacks were like almost grayish white because it was so dark the cameras were struggling to have enough light the commentary issues at the beginning where it's like we couldn't even hear kendall i forget mm. her co-commentator like we I think, couldn't I think his name's like danny something yeah we couldn't hear sorry, them sorry to him for one of the matches like kendall i think did great i really, yeah, I really enjoy the technical expertise that kendall brings like i think for she sure. is 
Um, I think other people don't like her for that, but I actually... That's insane to me. I It's wild to me as well. <laughs> I love hearing just the technical level of commentary she brings yes. because she's been there, but also she will walk and talk you through a sequence of what's happening, both the tactics and the technique behind it. And again, sure. it's when we do commentary, it's what I like to bring to our commentary yep. because you're explaining to the layman like, she is far more experienced than I am, and I want to hear Same. her insight into those pieces and places. And I think she does a really great job explaining the way through. Some, you know, sometimes overly for some people, but for me, it's like I am happy that you are explaining it because although I may know it, sometimes there's stuff that I don't know. That or you miss, you, you know, yeah. like she may have a better angle on something, and she yeah. talks about like grip placement a lot or mm -hmm. just positioning in general. And I really appreciate those nuances yeah. when you can't necessarily see what's happening. So it was frustrating for the first like I think three matches. We didn't have her commentary. Yeah, the English commentary took a little while to catch up. And then I kind of had like some other little like small things, like minutia things production wise that I would like to see. Um, and this is I know this is small, but in the post matches for the finals, it would have been cool to see. And even for the third place finishers, any replays replay. They had some replays, but they weren't as I don't know. They kind of cut them short. It was like, let's just see one sequence. I'd rather see a couple of the sequences, like all yeah. the scoring or all the subs. Those kinds of things would be a uh, nice little polish on the end. And then when people were being awarded, so when people got their third place medals, it was mainly for the photographers and not for the videographers. Yeah. So there was no like overlay. There wasn't really like a, and now you're a crowned person and they show them putting the crown on or here's yeah. your third place person and they show them opening the box and like posing with it. It seemed like they did that off to the side with the photographers, but for the video audience, we didn't really get to see a a clean yeah, close it up. Was, that's just a small thing, but, it's, but it it's, really it's, puts some some polish on the end of it. It's big, and it makes it look like again. I also I I, we're, we have one more kind of bitch about this. We don't mm. want to spend too much time on this, sure, but yeah. it is for me. I like to talk about it because it's super frustrating for again one of the few paid IBJJF events. It's again yeah. you're giving out one hundred and twenty thousand. You're awarding one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in prize money to these athletes. Like it's a big production. Yeah, there's just some little things that were like it being super dark. Mm -hmm. The commentary audio not working, like the overlays, the overlays, like yeah. the fact that we still don't have full names of athletes. Yeah. Dear God, guys, I don't know what flow has a contract with for that overlay. I <laughs> hate that overlay. It makes it look so amateur to just have the first initial and yeah. a last name. Just give me Especially the when we have full so many name on a Brazilian broadcast. athletes who have several middle and last names, and Dude, it's like, man, I don't remember this. I know this person's nickname. I don't know their whole. Look what Smooth Comp does. Yeah. Just see what Smooth Comp does for their tournament overlays for like judo and jujitsu and for ADCC, mm -hmm. and like, just do that. We have the technology <laughs> to to do it. We yeah, do. We have sure. it already. There is a company that makes an overlay. If you don't want to pay Smooth Comp, look at what they've done, mm -hmm. and like at worst. Just give me the two names. Just yeah. give me the athlete's full name. If, it's, sure. if they have eight names, cool. Put eight names on the screen. Yeah. Like, I would love for a professional event like this to give me their nickname. Like, give me Pato. Like, sure. Diego Pato Oliver. Like, give me that. Yeah. Like, that would be great. But at minimum, for an event like this, just give me the full name. Like, these guys are all world champions, world sure. medalists, Pan American champions. Like, these are the cream of the crop, the best athletes that the IBGGF has showcase them like show yeah. them off a little bit agreed have some b-roll in this event oh yeah you know? I think about that we had the match would end and we just look at a blank arena for one or two minutes and right. it's like hey guys this is a it's supposed to be a crown event right you know a, a event of substantial prestige mm -hmm. those little extra things really show and it's just unfortunate because i would love to be able to throw this on at the gym yeah but it kind of watches like any other really low production event and i right. think it can be so much better and i would love i want to see that because these athletes deserve it for sure so that's all i got uh moving on let's talk about the asian and oceanic trials for adcc the first one this is one of two trials for adcc it's adcc season all the time now <laughs> um we have um i can't find my notes now this is this is great uh, it's somewhere here, Austin. I believe in you. I, ooh, I, mm, there we go. Okay. So Flo has an, um, some names out for this. So this is, right now this is a trials that is, uh, it is the national championship, or sorry, the regional championship for ADCC. So because it is the first one, it is a qualifying trials event as well for the men, 
but it is not a qualifying trials event for the women because there are only eight women's slots in the three divisions. The second trials of a region, the second regional championship, so next year's championship for the Asian and Oceanic region will be the qualifying event for the world championships for ADCC. I try to always highlight that because this is for the regional championship. Mm -hmm. And so people kind of forget that sometimes that this is a championship event for ADCC. We call it trials, but it's also a regional championship. So under 66 kilos, uh, Flo has Jacob, Spatchy Brooks, uh, David Selesky, Ethan Thomas, uh, Juan Quinn, she, Michael Yoss, I butchered Juan's name. <laughs> uh, Daike Yonikura. At 77, we have Kenta Iwamoto. If <laughs> Kenta Iwamoto can make 77, good luck, everyone. Also in this division, we got Jeremy Skinner and George uh, Stromopoulos. Sadaropoulos. Yeah, Sadaropoulos. he's a former UFC guy, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, three dudes in that bracket are been to ADCC before. Yep. Uh, I still we also have Tomashiki Shara in this. We have uh, Birdrak Saruman. Who watched his match with Tynan on oh, what was that event? We watched it together. I forget what it was. Ooh, that doesn't. It was it the much. Australian event. It was Australia versus Brazil, and it was the blue event. Mm. He has a great match with that. We also have Matt Clark in this event, and JJ Wilson in this event. Um, but I think we're going to have Kenta and Jeremy Skinner in the finals. That's a, that's a great prediction. Those are the two I think are the highest uh, go, uh, caliber in that. Go in that back bracket. and watch Kenta's last try run. Yeah, and then for shits and giggles, go back and watch him versus JT Torres the World Championships. That's the best one. That's the, that's the best showing I think Kenta's had. Dude, that man is Sick. astonishing. And then go, back, go back and watch his match with Keith Corian on yeah. Sogi, like. Kenta's a monster. I don't think enough guys talk about just how much of a monster he is. Uh, I love Jeremy Skinner. Yep. This is a tough one. Yeah. Kenta's a tough dude to get across. Uh, 90, at 88 kilograms, we have Roberto de, uh, de Frias, former ADCC Trials winner. Um, we have uh, Kaya Rudolph as well. Osmat Al Os Osmanov. I always butcher these names because we only talk about it a couple times a year. Mm -hmm. Um we have Ruslan as well, Ruslan Isarov in this division. Again, Roberto Frias looked really good last trials. Wouldn't surprise me to see him take it here. Under 99 kilos, we have Harry Gretsch and Ben Hodgkinson. Uh, ben Hodgkinson, former winner. Uh, yeah, former trials winner. I forget which trials he won. Um, Sam Bagan Creonte, I think <laughs> I find him hilarious on uh, Instagram. He posts a lot of footage when he's over. He Pops in the B team pretty frequently. Yeah. Um, always posts fun, funny stuff there. We also have Daniel Schrauert Schrauer in this division as well. At 99, uh, we have... Speaking of B team, just on this last uh, under 99 division, Declan Moody too, another B team guy who I'm really interested to see how well he does. That name sounds really familiar. Yeah, he's like one of those B team guys that you don't hear a whole lot from because he's not on like the big name events, but I think he's kind of one of those like possible... Sleeper hidden, events? Yeah, hidden okay. gym kind of guy. So I'm curious to see how he does. Also in that division is Mark Grayson and former ADCC trials winner, Josh Saunders, who, uh, man, he looks like he is a terrible person to compete against. <laughs> Not like in a mean way, but just in like a imposing and very willing to just like, no, finish you. Right. Um, yeah, Josh Saunders is, I've been watching him for, we've watched him since last trials. Good luck getting through him. Only, again, only a division of nine. Right. So like, Oh, he's not going to be tired. Right. You got to fight a not tired Josh Saunders. Um, and then we have Adele Forentino, who is the former ADCC trials winner that went to ADCC last time um, at under 55 kilos. And then we also have uh, some professional male and female. Sorry, we have some masters people as well at this bracket. Uh, we have in the female divisions for plus 65 kilos, we have four. For under 65 kilos, we have six. And then for under 55 kilos, we have 17 women. Um, and I have the whole trials list up. You can look through all of the registrations there. Flo picked out, I think, some of the big names. Obviously have missed some folks. Um, but with Asian trials and Asian Oceanic trials, there's always sleepers that come out and impress you. For sure. Very, very excited to see uh, who on the Asian side and then who on the Australian side for the most part is going to show up for these ones. But that's what we got next week. Uh, awesome. I think that's it. Is there anything else that, you, that you're aware of? Um, I think that's it. Unless you want to talk about the Gordon match for 
we can, 30th. I mean, but we can talk about it in two weeks. Or yeah, I think, I think in a couple weeks is yeah. fine. You got anything fun going on this week? We got nah, Thanksgiving in like a couple days. Yeah, getting fat for Thanksgiving. Oh, I'm trying it's, to cut weight, which is great. <laughs> I'm trying to get my weight back down because I'm going to compete again for the first time in like a year. Silly. And there's a guy finally at my weight and age, and I'm like, well, the first guy I've seen in six months around here, so I got to make the weight now. Yeah, man, your belt level is <sighs> tough to find matches. Fuck. It's annoying. Yeah, oh, I know it. But and then it's only like eight fat. pounds, but it's just enough to be annoying at Thanksgiving. That's enough. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. definitely during Thanksgiving. So that's my that's my new renewed interest is like all right, I gotta make them. I stepped on the scale and I went, whoo, let myself go a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, just trying to hit some open mats. I think that's probably gonna be it. Nice. So I got nothing else going on aside from that. Um, if you want to hear more about that, shoot us a DM. Can't wait to talk about trials next week. Um, as always in the show, I'm your host, Maine, your host, Austin. And we have the grappling rounds, so that what it is. Stay safe. If you like the show, please consider sharing it on Facebook with the folks at your gym. It's the best way that we grow the show, and we really appreciate it. You can reach out to us on email. We also have Instagram. We have Facebook. We have Twitter. We have Google+. Plus. Until that shuts down. We have a website. If you have an event you would like to have us cover, please let us know. If you have a name, like most people do, and you'd like to have us stop butchering it, let us know. Reach out to us. The show is also available on YouTube, Spotify, in addition to iTunes, and every other podcast service. We very much appreciate your time, and thank you.